Live from the Danger Room, hidden deep under a Westchester mansion, it's the Mighty Marvel Tooncast with Tim Nidell and Jeremy Shields. Two of you. The odds are getting better and better. Spiders, danger. We always kiss the bridesmaids, too. This ain't Cajun country, hun. Zip those lips. Kumbaya! He's alive. And in a lousy mood. I can't believe it. Get away while you can! Join them as they review classic Marvel animation. And now, here's Tim and Jeremy. Excelsior! Hey there, Toonsters! Well, or should I call you Marvel Toonsters? Uh, but either way, welcome to the mighty Marvel Toon cast. We are here in the Danger Room. And why do I say we? Because I am, of course, one of your hosts, Jeremy Shields, and never go to the Danger Room alone, so I brought with me... Hey, guys. It's me, Tim Nadell, from Saturday Morning Rewind. And, of course, you might know me from the Neverland Podcast, or you might actually be somebody who listens to the Neverland Podcast and says, oh, yeah, that's that Jeremy guy from the Mighty Marvel Tooncast. That's right. Yeah, see? That's what, I'm, that's, what, that's what I'm saying right now in my head. It's like, oh, my gosh, that's Jeremy from the Neverland Podcast. <laughs> and then people who listen to Saturday Morning Rewind are like, dude, that's Tim from the Mighty Marvel Tooncast. Oh. And I'd be like, thanks, Mom. <laughs> exactly. Oh, but we are here... To talk some X-Men, the other of my two favorite animated series from the 90s, from the Marvel half, because, you know, I do love Batman, the animated yes, series yes. as well. Gotta love it. And that one, I think, really paved the way, probably, for some of these other more more serious style for comic sure. book uh, tie-in style animated series where we, we weren't so goofy. I think, you know, between, like, the Batman and X-Men, uh, you know, being, taking this stuff seriously uh, really set things up for that Spider-Man series to also be able to take itself ser- seriously enough, but still have some fun with exactly. it. Exactly. Uh, you had to, to have where, humor in Spider-Man. Yeah, you had to have some humor because it is Spider-Man. And how he deals with danger is by cracking jokes. But you know, X-Men is such a great series for, you know, being able to be serious about its subject matter. And uh, really, uh, the writing was was so spot on that, you know, heck, I was oh, well, I guess when it first premiered, I was I was because mm, it, it premiered in 92. So I was like, you know, I was a teenager. Yeah, I was 12. So, yeah. And so I was still able to, of course, I loved X-Men already anyway. But, you know, I was able to get in and to enjoy it. And even at age 40, I can still enjoy these because the writing is so compelling and such a good show. But we're on episode two. So what is episode two about, Tim? Episode two, we it is called Enter Magneto, which is <laughs> a you know, perfect name because this is when we get introduced to one of the greatest villains of all time, Magneto. This episode is loosely based on Uncanny X-Men number one from 1963, where, of course, Magneto is, appears and attacks the Cape Citadel missile base. So as you can see, if you, if you are familiar with Enter Magneto, the episode of the cartoon... You'll see at the end of it how he attacks a missile silo or whatnot. And uh, I'm glad you brought that up because I was actually noticing that because uh, I've read the first issue of Uncanny mm-hmm. X-Men and I remember him attacking a missile silo. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I remember I've seen... I always appreciated this. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I love how X-Men animated series is very... I'm not very true to the comic, you know. It's, it's loosely based on a lot of the comic storylines, but as a kid, I guess as a preteen for me... The animated series was an introduction to the X-Men for me. I know you said that you were already a fan of the X-Men prior to the animated series, but for me, this is my first introduction to them. And so I would go from watching the animated series, and then I would go find out the true stories by going to the comic store after the episode aired and read the comics. Ah, and did you collect some of the X Men Adventures oh, comics of course. that they did based off the series? Of course, yeah. No, my my every Saturday after episodes were done. My dad would take me to the local comic book store in Reno, and we'd pick up X Men Adventures and pick up like an older X Men, Uncanny X Men, or something like that. And so I'd get to know both worlds of the X Men. Awesome. Oh, and here lately I've been seeing in comic shops they have a, a True Believers series, but I think all they might only be doing the first issue of each. But I saw them picking up some of the old '90s comics and re-releasing them. But I, I've only been seeing issue number one of, uh, of like uh, Cable and the New Mutants and then the New Mutants. And then uh, I saw uh, they did the the first time when there was an X-Men comic that came out drawn by Jim Lee. And it kind of gave Uncanny X-Men a little bit of a, a reboot where it was focusing on certain – because the X-Men was split into the blue team and the gold team at the time. Uh-huh. 
And I've, and they, they reprinted that issue where Uncanny X-Men focused on the gold team, which was cool because I didn't actually have that issue. But uh, go out to comic shops and try to look for those, anyone who's interested in this, because I'm, I'm hoping maybe if they sell enough of these True Believer editions, maybe they'll keep re-releasing some of these older issues, uh, you know, reprinting, because there was good stuff in the 90s. I'm not so much into some of the newer things, but back in the 90s, it was excellent. I think 90s for the X-Men... I mean, I don't want to say they were the best because I'm sure 60s and 70s had great stuff too. But actually, no, the 60s and 70s didn't have great okay, stuff. They okay. Actually, they actually had to reboot the book with a, a giant size X-Men where they brought in Nightcrawler, Colossus, Storm, and uh-huh. Wolverine uh, because the book just wasn't selling before. And so they rebooted it with some new characters, and it kind of got going. And then Chris Claremont came along, and then throughout the 80s became a big surge in the X-Men because Chris Claremont is a brilliant writer. Yeah. Uh, okay. And a lot of the things you're going to see in the X-Men animated series were actually based on Chris Claremont's work. Interesting. Yeah, I yes. was going to say because well, the nineties to me were the heyday of it. Because yeah, that's when I was reading. Exactly. Me too. Nineties comic books, and I used to as 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 a teenager. Well, I was in high school, of course, and I used to get lunch money to go to a local like grocery store to get some you know fried chicken and French fries or whatnot. And um, I used to save my money and, and buy X Men instead. Instead of having oh, yeah. lunch, I would buy X Men. <laughs> there you go. Who needs food? Exactly. But it's very ironic because I, I was very. I was a chubby kid, so you would you never would have guessed that I wasn't eating lunch. <laughs> That's why you're so skinny now. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! So, Inter Magneto. Let's get into Inter Magneto. I love how the first two episodes that we talked about are mainly about the Sentinels. It really sets up those enemies of the X Men, and this episode mm-hmm. here really sets up Magneto and Sabretooth, two of the best X Men villains of all time. Honestly, yes. And this story pretty much opens up with Beast still in prison. You know, he's, he was captured in the Sentinel episodes. Still in prison and uh, reading a little book called Animal Farm, which is mm-hmm. perfect for him to be reading at a prison, honestly. And um, Have you ever read it? Um, years and years and years ago, yeah. I read, I read it a couple of years ago. It's uh, George Orwell, who is also famous for writing 1984. It is a well, well-received book, although it does... George Orwell was big into the ideas of socialism and communism, uh, but he also liked to point out the flaws that were also there, but he was a big proponent. So be prepared if you read Animal Farm. That's actually – he uses animals to kind of tell his mm-hmm. views on communism exactly. and how you, yep. it's supposed to work. Yep. Um, so, just, but, but it is interesting that it is – it's an intelligent book, and even if you're – Definitely a capitalist. It's a good read. Yeah, it actually is, yeah. And it's nothing that you would have imagined it being, honestly. Yeah, and then you have these two stupid guards that say, oh, look what he's reading, Animal Farm. <laughs> exactly. Are you looking at the pictures, mutant? <laughs> they think that he's reading like a little children's book about animals on yeah. a farm, like Charlotte's Web or something like that. Ugh, foolish guards <laughs> with their uneducated swine. How did your uneducated time ever take Jerusalem? <laughs> and, of course, while this is all happening, you know, a lot of chaos is happening outside the prison. You know, the lights are exploding and walls are crumbling and sc- guards are like scrambling around trying to figure out what's going on. And this is when we first see Magneto when he busts through the cell wall, a beast's cell. And I have some audio from that. And this is also when the soldiers start to wet their pants. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> here's a little bit of audio from that scene. I don't believe we've met Magneto, I presume? Come, we must hurry. Your solicitude is appreciated, I assure you. I regret, however, that... What are you waiting for? My day in court, actually. Professor Xavier and I feel... Xavier? Charles Xavier had you break into the mutant control agency? Reluctantly, I assure you. And he would leave you to rot in prison? So one thing I forgot to mention was the release date of this episode. It was actually November 27th, 1992, and I remember watching it on the first release date. Do you remember watching it the first day? Um, I th- Yeah, I, I did watch this one on its first day. I, I did have a kerfuffle. I remember I, I saw the very first episode of X-Men. It was on Halloween that year, mm-hmm. and then something had happened that where I, uh, I had missed the second part of Night of the Sentinels. Ah, oh, okay. And I actually had to borrow it from my buddy Philip to watch that one, but I did catch uh, Night of the Sentinels uh, or Enter Magneto because I was trying to videotape all these things and yeah, I had to fix yeah, my yeah. videotape and put the episode, pack, <laughs> you know, the one that I'd missed and put, get that onto my tape and then start recording because uh, 
somewhere I might still have those videotapes, but now I don't need it because I've got DVDs. Yeah, that's funny you say that because I used to videotape every episode too in order. I used to take out all the commercials of the X-Men and rewatch them over and over and over again. And then when they finally released the X-Men Adventures comic books, I used to watch the episode of my videotape and then read the comic book afterwards as well. (laughs) Yeah, and when you're recording, you're sitting there hovering over your pause button (laughs) so you can pause it before the commercial starts. And then you anticipate the end of commercial, so you try to record it live. Yeah, I I got good at that, though, because after you watch it, after you do that so many times, you realize what kind of commercial is played last in the last of a commercial block. something from the network. Exactly, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) And then Fox News did start having those little things, you know, to to indicate this is the end of commercial and this is the show because there was actually this legal requirement that started happening because Ah, of toy commercials. Okay. You know, complicated thing. Look it up later, people. (laughs) Interesting, interesting. But I, I love Magneto's surprise because he doesn't expect the X-Men to or Charles Xavier to have an attack happen on a human facility because exactly. that sounds like something he would yeah. do. Yeah, because Magneto is the that. one known. You know, Magneto, he's he's a bad guy, but he's not a bad guy. You know what I mean? Yeah, they lightened him up here in the later years because the early ones, the you know, he was part of the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. They were intentionally just evil because yeah. Magneto actually wanted to rule over the mutants that were going to conquer the world. Exactly. Yep. But they got away from, and they just started calling it the Brotherhood of Mutants because they said, well, he doesn't have to be evil. He could just be a different point of view. And actually, Magneto became a little bit more of an interesting character when they started making that change. I must say something. No, I'll save it for when we talk about the bio. Of Magneto. Okay. Unless you want to do it now. You want us to talk about a little bit of bio about Magneto? It's your synopsis. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's talk okay. a little bit about the creation and bio of Magneto while we're, you know, actually sitting here talking about him. So it was create he was created by writer Stan Lee and artist Jack Kirby. Of course, his first appearance was X Men number one, which was dated yep. uh September nineteen sixty three. So of course Magneto is uh the main arch enemy of the X Men. His abilities, um, he's able to generate and control magnetic fields, of course. And uh, he's a Holocaust survivor, which I think we all knew that, mainly because they really focus on that in the live-action movies a lot. Mm-hmm. Of course, him and Professor X were really close friends when they were younger. And here's a, here's a quote by Stan Lee. Stan Lee said, He did not think of Magneto as a bad guy. He just wanted to strike back to people who are so bigoted and racist. He was trying to defend the mutants... And because society was not treating them fairly, he was going to teach society a lesson. He was a danger, of course, but I never thought of him as a villain. So I, I oh, love yeah. that because I think most people actually do consider Magneto a villain. Yeah, and, and he is because he does a lot of villainous things against humanity. Yeah. He's he's His intentions are almost good, but his methods are definitely problematic. And writer Chris Claremont actually has confirmed that Malcolm X was an inspiration for Magneto. Yes. That, and that's really, I think, part of when they really started leaning that way because when you read some of the early uh, X-Men comics, and I have, uh, I've checked some out of the library, it, uh, Magneto almost seems too one-dimensional. He's just, uh, he's more villainous, and you can't, you can't quite sympathize with him. And I have seen, like, in Uncanny X-Men 150 in August 1981, that's when he was being more portrayed as a Jewish Holocaust survivor mm-hmm. while searching for his wife, Magna. Uh, and so that's when they started getting a little bit more of that background. And so you started to understand him a little bit better of why he's that way. And, he's, and with Chris Claremont's definite look of, of him being more Malcolm X, that started to come out yep. where he was, like, a, just an opposite point of view. Yeah. And Chris also went on and said that uh, Professor X is pretty much Martin Luther King Jr. Yep, he, he was he was trying to be as peaceful yeah, as he could. Exactly, I love that. <laughs> I love that combination. That it's very insightful, and I never would have put them together, but it makes so much sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's one of the things that's really great. Their interactions in that first film because it really just shows they're yeah. they're they have the same goals. Not completely, but mostly. I mean, they want to be able to have a place in society, but Magneto would rather dominate the humans. And when Professor X wants peace. And so uh, really, and that is very similar because Malcolm X does more of a black power movement compared to Martin Luther King, who just wants everyone, everyone. to be yeah. looked at for the content of their character, not yeah. the color of their skin. And and so, I mean, you see a difference, but yet they, they it's like they have similar goals, but their their ways of getting there are and because of their end goals being also kind of different, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's that little bit of difference of what they're 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 
motivations are that yeah. really kind of shape who they are. Although Magneto has at times joined the X-Men yep. and tried to go for peace. Yeah. We'll see that in the animated series as season like two comes along. You're all fools. Heroic <laughs> fools. Yes. Best line coming up at the end of the season. Here's a little bit of trivia. We all know that Sir Ian McKellen played Magneto as a live version of him in, in the Brian Singer movies. But do you know who was approached first to be the live action Magneto? I'm thinking Rudger Hauer. I thought I heard that once. It's a name you probably don't know. His name is David Hemblem. No idea. But you hear him in the animated series. He's the voice actor of Magneto in the animated series. Awesome. Brian Singer wanted him to play Magneto, and he couldn't do it oh, because of, of so time good. time issues. I think he was working on a TV show. If, if I remember correctly, he was working on a TV show. He couldn't do it. I bet you he, he I don't remember, but I bet you he regrets that. Yeah, that would have been really awesome. Although I, Ian McKellen was a great He Magneto. was. He was. But he's also a little older than I would have. I don't know. He's a little too old for me as a Magneto. Mainly because I'm coming off the animated series, seeing this younger guy playing Magneto. You know what I mean? Yeah, but you know, you're if you're considering a guy who's supposed to be a Holocaust survivor, exactly. he, he needs exactly. to be older. Yeah, that's one, a good point. One thing I have theorized because uh, with the mutant gene and the powers, I've kind of wondered if it also does something to slow down aging a little oh, bit. Oh yeah, yeah, that's true. Because you have that you know timey wimey Doctor Who thing going on in the Marvel universe, you know. Because <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, heck, uh, Peter Parker has been in his twenties for about thirty <laughs> years now. So, like, you know, time doesn't quite move the same. No, they sure don't. <laughs> yeah, so you do have a little bit of an odd thing going on with that. So, I mean, he's he, you can tell he's a bit older, but he's he's a youthful old man. Yeah. So that's about what I have for the creation of Magneto. Do you have anything to add about the, the character of Magneto? Yeah, this is interesting because you, you got so many different names. Because, like, in, in the cartoon, they called him Eric Magnus or yeah. just simply Magnus. Yeah. Uh, but he was actually born as Max Eisenhart sometime in the late 20s to a middle-class German-Jewish family. Uh, later, though, he did adopt the name. Uh, he, he had married a woman named Magda, moved to Ukraine, uh, and he adopted the name Magnus. had a daughter named Anya. Uh, though later he got uh, a cover identity called Eric Lyncher, and I'm just kind of speeding over a whole lot of stuff. Uh, because, you know, he has now shown some of his power, and Magda left, and although he... This has been retconned here lately, but Magda did give birth to some twins, Pietro and Wanda. Mm -hmm. You might know them as sure Quicksilver do. and the Scarlet Witch. Mm -hmm. Now, here in more recent comics, and this is why I quit reading some of this stuff, because they've decided, oh, no, you guys were just experiments. You aren't mutants. Huh. And I, they really did this because they wanted to pull the two characters away from Fox. Because uh, Fox has the rights to all mutants. Yeah. And they wanted those two characters to be in the Avengers films because they have both been Avengers. And so they retconned and even changed them in the movie to where they're not mutants that they were experimented on and took them away from Magneto. So there's no concept of that. And you'll notice that in the Marvel Studios films, they do not call them the Scarlet Witch or Quicksilver. That's true. They're Pietro and Wanda because they can't use the names <laughs> because Fox owns those rights because they're mutants. This would be a lot easier if Fox would just play ball with Marvel <laughs> Studios and bring it all together in the Marvel yeah. Cinematic Universe and reboot their X-Men film franchise, which is hit or miss. Exactly. They, they need to start fresh with that. Yes, yeah, start fresh. But, uh, yeah, that's a whole different thing. But you've got a whole lot of different things where, you know, Magneto did, of course, rise. We had the uh, Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, which Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch were actually part of it at the time. But they slowly start to doubt what their father is doing. Although at one point, uh, Magneto tried to convince Lorna Dane that she was his daughter because Lorna Dane also has magnetic powers. But she turns out to not be related whatsoever and is actually one of the uh, members of X Factor later on into the 90s. Uh, so, But he has had a, a very sordid history of supposedly being killed and coming back, which they did get into that in the X-Men animated series. That does happen. Mm -hmm. Uh also, Magneto, one of the uh, most frightening feats he's ever done is rip the adamantium right off of Wolverine's oh, yes. skeleton. I remember that. Nearly killing him. Yeah. That was intense. Yeah. So good. So you, you, you've got a long history of all of these different things, which if I spent time uh, going over all of it, it would take way too long. Uh, there's even stuff, you know, the House of M and the Son of M, which has been really big things that affected the entire Marvel Universe that involved Magneto and also uh, his daughter, Wanda, the Scarlet Witch. Uh, heck, at one point, uh, 
the Scarlet Witch, basically when she says stuff, she can cause it to happen, uh, which they haven't really get into in the Avengers. I hope they kind of do the show that she's more powerful than what she's shown. Yeah. But she uses her powers and says no more mutants and wipes out the mutant powers of most of the mutant kind. Oh, wow. Yeah, about 98% of the mutant population, uh, and which did include Magneto. Although that has been uh, changed back and everybody started getting their powers back. And, uh, I mean, there's a whole mess of things. If you go into the Wikipedia page, you can find all kinds of different things going on. But, yes, he's very much an intense character. A lot of interesting, you know, a lot of history with uh, with the Master of Magnetism. But I've spoken too long. Let's get back to the episode. Let's get back to the episode. So where we left off, Magneto is trying to persuade Beast to escape prison because he's there to help mutants. You know what I mean? And uh, that's when I Beast... Beast was on his side until yeah. Charles Xavier's name comes up, really. <laughs> yeah, really. That's true. And uh, that's when Beast says, no, I need to stand trial. That's the best thing to do. I need it, It'll be good if I stand trial and actually don't escape prison. And yeah. uh, that's when we get fast forwarded to... Yeah, mitigating circumstances is what he'll use later. So yeah. people understand why. Exactly. They did what they did. Exactly. He'll, he'll be a menace if he escaped prison. He won't be setting an example. So, exactly. we fast forward to then, Professor X and Jubilee are in the mansion watching videotape from the prison breakout, or the almost prison breakout, I guess, and that's when they see Magneto, and that's when we learn that Professor X and me, Magneto used to be really close friends. Mm -hmm. And I have some audio from that as well. Who's the guy? He was once a friend. Why? We met after a war. I worked in a hospital secretly using my mental powers to heal the survivors. A dedicated young aide named Magnus assisted me. Together we helped patients rediscover the joy of life. We became friends. But for some, a war is never over. Remnants of the army that had so brutally occupied his small country returned, attempting to retake it. We saved what patients we could, revealing for the first time, to each other, to anyone, our long-hidden mutant powers. But Magnus wasn't through. He'd lost his family when those people overran his country. Consumed by rage, he tried to destroy them. I stopped him, but I'd never seen such a change in a man. So then after that, we fast forward to when Beast is actually in his court date. We got Cyclops and Wolverine in the audience watching, seeing everything that's going on. And all of a sudden, Rawr! yes, thank you for that audio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I have a feeling that's going to be used on me several times now. Rawr! All of a sudden, Sabretooth pops into the courtroom, causing chaos. You know, people are running for their lives. And um, that's when we actually get to see also that Wolverine and Sabretooth also have a past. Oh, yes. Although we don't get to get into it completely. Not quite yet. Time. Nope, not even in this episode quite yet. That's going to be very, I, very soon. On the trial, though, I do want to comment how interesting how I love how well it's played out of showing how Beast is not getting a fair trial. Because yeah. the, even the way the judge says, well, we wouldn't want to, anyone to think we weren't being fair. <laughs> yes. And that's the reason you're just like, oh, wow. No wonder Wolverine is so ticked off by the time Sabretooth comes. Yeah, no kidding. No, Wolverine's already about to attack <laughs> the whole courtroom before Sabretooth does. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so Sabretooth comes in and causes all this chaos, and uh, Cyclops and Wolverine are about to attack, and Sabretooth gets knocked out by, I guess, the security guards there in the courtroom, and that's when they decide, or Cyclops, I guess, decides to take him back to the mansion, because we all know that Wolverine's not going to take him back. He's going to kill him. <laughs> yeah. Uh, come on, Wolverine. We're going to kill him. Good. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it, bub. <laughs> <laughs> You gotta love Wolverine. Oh, yes. I because love our him. other catchphrase of this show, because Wolverine. Exactly, yes. I was going to mention that at some point. I didn't know when, though. At some <laughs> point. <laughs> well, we can use it multiple times. Yes. So let's fast forward to at the mansion. You see Sabretooth is lying there unconscious still. And Jubilee is feeling a little sorry for him. And here's a little audio from that. Is he going to be okay, Professor? He seems to have stabilized. I'm glad. Something about him reminds me of Wolverine. His name's Sabretooth. Wolverine knows him. And hates him. Did he give a reason? Does he ever? Love because that. Wolverine. That's why. <laughs> yes, because Wolverine. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, perfect timing. 
<laughs> so many things are set up in the audio too. You know, you see Jubilee, the soft side of Jubilee. You see Cyclops's kind of hate of Wolverine, and I don't know. I just I just love this series. I just it's like I don't a, know if it, I'd call it hate. hate yeah, it's because you know you, there's a there's a there's a, a kinmanship there, like yeah. soldiers at wars, and I mean, but they just have they this different personalities. They have a personality difference, but mm. they would lay down their lives to save the other one still. Exactly. And we do see that. Yeah, I mean, we they're, do. You know, there's a loyalty there and a camaraderie, but they just have that personality friction. So I wouldn't call it hate. It's not hate. No, it's not. It's frustration. <laughs> yeah. He doesn't, does he, he ever? He doesn't quite understand Wolverine, and nobody even does. Uh, Wolverine doesn't even understand no. Wolverine. <laughs> you want to know why? Because Wolverine. That's right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So that is when they suddenly find out that Magneto is causing a lot of trouble and actually setting off missiles that are trying to, like, start another war, I guess, as, as his plan. To kill the humans, start another war, have them kill each other off, I guess. And a, yeah, I guess so. Let me try to play some audio from that. How come we're supposed to trash your old enemy? But we gotta go easy on mine. Dare oppose me. Your most powerful weapons shall destroy you, and mutants will hide in fear no more. I can give an answer to that question too, and it's not just because Wolverine. Oh, okay. But the answer would be, well, the saber tooth isn't causing nuclear missiles to go launching, okay? Did I <laughs> because say Wolverine? Wow, okay. <laughs> That's... So, yeah, I love him asking the question, how come we got to go easy on my old enemy and trash yours? Like, Sabretooth <laughs> isn't launching nuclear missiles right now, okay? Sabretooth, he's sleeping. He's having a little slumber yes. right now. Yes. <laughs> uh, because Magneto. That's why. Because Magneto. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. We're going to have to get some t-shirts that say, because Wolverine, <laughs> the Mighty Marvel Toon cast. Yes. I will get on that, and I will try to get that for sale uh, somehow or another. <laughs> uh, I hope so. T Public, here Good. I come. I will, I will. <laughs> hey, you're you're an artist. Draw something. I'll think we of will, something. Yeah, I'll think of something. Yes, something that draw it won't something, be. Draw something. We'll letter it up. We will something try that to get won't this be available on T Public, y'all. That won't be copywritten or anything, so we can easily use it. Exactly, dude. Uh, T-shirts right there. I don't know if you want to edit that out of the show because we don't have it ready yet. But uh, we can just keep it, and maybe we'll see. Yeah. Uh, I forget where I was now. Montana and your little cool studio that you built up with all kinds of neat stuff. Oh, that's true. I do have some neat stuff. <laughs> so do I. I'm surrounded by it too. Sweet. Not your neat stuff, but <laughs> uh, that'd be kind of weird if you were. I am surrounded by your neat stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so this is when the X Men, of course, jump into action. They go to where Magneto is to confront him, and you hear one of the best lines from this episode coming from, of course, Wolverine. I'm glad you decided to join me in the liberation of mutant kind. Today begins a new world for all of us. A world where we needn't hide in corners and crawl in fear. I don't know what corner you crawled out of, bub. But we don't find nuclear missiles all that liberating. Come quietly or be taken. And I hope you want to be taken. Good lines. I mean, that's uh, Wolverine. Because Wolverine. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hashtag because Wolverine. Let's start that. Exactly. <laughs> he that's, does the best lines in this show. He I really swear. does. You guys need to go back. I, I don't want to do another shameless plug on my podcast, but I had a great interview with the voice actor Wolverine, Cal Dodd. And let me just tell you, the voice actor, he pretty much is exactly the same as Wolverine on the show. And his language matches. <laughs> it really does. He's got the coolest accent too. It's like a, it's like a Australian meets Canadian accent, and I love it. So go back to my right. <laughs> go back to my podcast that came out. I think it was around March of 2017. So go back and listen to that. It's a really fun, entertaining episode. All right, you shameless plug. I know. I had to. I had to. I'm sorry. <laughs> So all these missiles are going off in the animated series, and Storm takes it upon herself to save the, the world because you know Storm, she's a leader of the X Men animated series, right? Uh, Is it ever really uh, talked about? 
they might have got into it at some point because in the 80s, uh, especially when uh, X Factor was formed with the initial X Men team, yeah. and Cyclops was leading that team, Storm was left in overall command over the X Men and, and yeah. Field Commander. Exactly. And when Cyclops had come back, and that's when they launched the X Men title, and the Uncanny X Men was Gold Team, and the X Men title was Blue Team, Cyclops was the elite Field Commander of the Blue Team, and Storm was Field Commander of the Gold Team. And so you had like these two different teams, and it was really kind of cool. Yeah, I don't think they really get into it that detail in the animated series, but I always assumed she was still the leader of the X Men in the animated series. Oh, she wasn't, but she she was very capable. Yeah, exactly. Storm is yeah. very awesome, and she is smart as a whip. She's very streetwise, having grown up in the streets of, uh, I believe, Kenya yep. as a thief. Uh, and she was actually revered as a goddess amongst her people. Because of her weather powers, so she had gained a lot of wisdom, and so Storm does very good in the field as a field commander. Yeah, and here is some audio of her trying to disarm the missiles. I know what I must do. Storm! Wait, don't do it! Is Storm doing what I think she's doing? She's gonna blow up those missiles herself! Storm! Storm, answer me! Not now! Storm! I sense your plan of action, but there is no need for self-sacrifice. Professor, I must... Open your mind. Absorb what Cerebro knows about the missile's computers. Yes, I understand now. And then, of course, she stops the missiles from going. I, I believe she just makes them go into the ocean. Yeah, she sorts circuits and disarms the warheads with a little bit of electricity instead of detonating the warheads yep. somewhere over the ocean. Yep. So they don't actually go off. So, and but how cool is isn't that like where they got the ideas from the Matrix? I swear to absorb what Cerebro knows from the, and the you huh. know the computer <laughs> knows all the stuff about the missiles and it, the professor is able to just download it into her brain oh, in a matter so of seconds. True. I mean, come on, that is so true. And this came out at a good time period to where you know the writers of Matrix could easily. Came across, across this and seen it and, and wrote it into the into the movies. We're on to you, Wachowski, whatever you are. So <laughs> Wachowski, they used to be the uh, now, I, think uh, they're, I think they're sisters now. Yeah, oh, something like that. I don't that. know what's going on with that, but yeah, it's a side story. <laughs> That's oh, a whole different it. other podcast right there. Whole other podcast. We'll let Mark Dice deal with that one for anyone who knows who that guy is. <laughs> so Storm stops the missiles, of course, and there ends pretty much the episode because after that's done, the Magneto gets away from the X-Men, and we get this great end dialogue from Magneto that I'll play right now. You've trained your X-Men well, Xavier. They defied me and delayed my war. You and your mutants protect the humans who seek to destroy us. Why? Why have you turned against your own kind? And it says, to be continued on the bottom. Yeah, and because Magneto will be back next time. So but I do love, uh, there's a Wolverine line that, uh, you, uh, but I, I love this where uh, when Storm, you know, is exhausted and falls to the ground and uh, Wolverine's already there to check on her and Cyclops comes around, but Wolverine, is she okay? And he goes, must be my company. She's asleep. <laughs> yes. Mission accomplished, buddy. Because you know? <laughs> it's the most friendly thing he ever says to Cyclops, but I just love that must be my company. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> because Wolverine. Because Wolverine. So final, <laughs> final thoughts on this episode. Go ahead. Oh, I love this. This was a, this was a really great way to bring Magneto into the series yeah. in the modern version where he, we, we get to see him as uh, maybe a bit misguided, maybe overly aggressive, but having just a point of view of things where especially at the, you know, at, we, with the conversation he has with Beast and then there at the end of the clip you just played where he just doesn't understand trying to make peace with the humans and – you know, they, they try to dabble in this episode to show that, oh, the men who invaded the country where Magneto was from had come back and stuff. But really, you understand it better when you realize he's a Holocaust survivor where he has been, because he was different from, from the people in power, was rounded up and locked in, in, in prisons and, was you know, his people were being killed. You can understand that perspective. It's like when seeing someone who's trying to make peace with him, he looks at Xavier as like he's making peace with the Nazis. And so he's like, why are you betraying yeah. our kind? Yeah. Why would you make peace with the people who are going to kill us? Magneto just can't see it any other way. That, you know, the common people are not Nazis. They're just afraid I love how they also didn't make the first two episodes about Magneto, which they easily could have done because that's what the comics did. Instead, yeah. we get the Sentinels, and it's just, it has a better build up because they kind of save him later in the series, episode three. 
Yeah, and it really does help you establish the world that the X-Men are living in. And when you see them being harassed by Sentinels, mm-hmm. uh, now you can see when Magneto comes in and he says stuff like, you know, these are the people that want to kill us. Like, hey, these people made Sentinels and you're wanting to make peace with them? Yeah, exactly. And now you get to see how trapped the X-Men would have felt because really they have nobody on, on their side 100%. You know what I mean? Besides the X-Men themselves, they're fighting for both sides and nobody really is except for them. Yeah, which thankfully that does start to change as, as things happen yes. along the way. <laughs> and we shall talk about that in a later episode. Yes, but until then, make sure you find us on Facebook. We are the Mighty Marvel Tooncast. We are working on having lots of fun on that Facebook page. It slowly builds and can becomes a community when you go and just simply click like. Also, make sure you subscribe to us on iTunes. Those of you that are already subscribed to the Neverland Podcast main iTunes feed, you're probably already getting Marvel Tooncast. Maybe that's how you're listening to this show, but Marvel Tooncast does have its own feed. We'd like you to go into that feed and leave some reviews specifically for the Mighty Marvel Tooncast because that does help the show grow. So make sure you do that. And, of course, subscribe to the Neverland Podcast if you're not already a subscriber. And, of course, as Tim has plugged many times, go to SaturdayMorningRewind.com. Make sure you subscribe to that one because that's a fun show as well. And he's been mixing it up and talking about video games and all kinds of stuff. And so he's trying to be more like my show because he's talking (laughs) about video games and other stuff. But that's why we like his show because he's so much like what I'm doing. So we're both good shows. You're going to love it because we don't do the exact same thing all the time. Right. But exactly. He's getting geekier as he goes along, man. (laughs) So he's bringing the geekery. So yes. And then of course, you know, make sure to check out if you're not already, which you already should be check out the Neverland podcast. Yes. Which if I didn't say, I should say now, yes, the Neverland podcast where we have what more Disney focus compared to the Saturday morning rewind. Although I do branch out into other stuff, but we do some Disney, which means Pixar, Marvel, star Wars. Oh, and Disney. And occasionally I like to branch outside, and we'll talk about some games and stuff like that. But uh, I don't get as many voice actors, because that's not what I'm focused on. So if you want to hear some voice actors, go to Saturday Morning Rewind, and then come to me for everything else. But, yeah. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> that was really bad promotion, but you get the idea. But until we come back here, probably, hopefully in two weeks, if we do this right, you're going to hear from us every two weeks. Tell your friends, tell your enemies, tell the mutants out there, because the mutants are going to want to hear their story about the X-Men. Yes, but until next time, Excelsior. Excelsior.